we're good. Welcome to um, the first GEO Forum Lecture of 2021. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening, um, Vijay Potula, who is an ENT and head and neck surgeon um, from the UK. He works in the northwest of England um, and has been a consultant in the UK since 2001. Uh, he also is the chairperson of the ENT UK Global Health Committee. Um, and it's my pleasure to uh, invite him to speak to you all today. Um, and he's going to speak on his experiences in the Shravana project in Hyderabad. Um, Vijay, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, I'd be grateful if you could share your slides and look forward to hearing your talk. Okay, thank you, Misha. Uh, and Richard for inviting me to speak. Uh, this is mainly sharing about the work I've been doing for the past 15 years and the challenges what I encountered in developing a, a service for um, children with hearing impairment. Well, most of you probably already aware of uh, the issues related to children's hearing. Uh, children's hearing loss is dealt completely in a different way than the adult uh, hearing loss which is much easier because they already uh, have a speech and they can tell you by pewter and audiometer if they can hear or not, whereas children can't. Uh, the, there is the, for mainly the burden of deafness is nearly apparently according to the WHO figures, 34 million children out of the 466 million people um, have got disabling hearing loss. The, the among the children, most of them are uh, seen in South Asia, Asia Pacific and Sub-Saharan Africa. Well, why should we worry about these children with deafness? Uh, because the consequences of deafness in children is much more severe when compared to adults, though I'm not denigrating the, uh, uh, the severity of deafness even among adults. Uh, if you do not have uh, hearing and the child will not have um, speech. If you have no hearing and speech, their communication will be very poor. And most of the things what we learn is by, by our hearing and speech or intelligence developed because of our hearing. If you don't know, do not have hearing and speech and communication and your verbal intelligence would not develop either. As a consequence, you, the child will not have any education or any employment or even partnerships in lives. Uh, though the person looks, the child or adult looks physically perfectly normal, but they do not feel as, uh, as human as you because you know, they do not have any kind of communication with anything else or anybody else. So, well, can they be helped, these children who are born with hearing loss and who develop these consequences, can they be reversed? Can they be helped? Yes, they can be. Majority of them can be. But the most crucial part is early detection. Until recently, until, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, nearly 20 years ago, even in uh, the developed countries did not have any uh, universal uh, screening for deafness. So if there is no sound stimulation for a child and the uh, neurons would either atrophy or those neurons will be taken over by other sensory, uh, uh, other senses such as vision. So the, um, uh, the, uh, auditory nerve, the brainstem and cortex will be all replaced with some other things. Um, the, the main plasticity of the neurons would be very good until three and a half years of age. And you know, possibly the maximum of nearly six to seven years of age. In majority of these developing countries, there is no early detection. As a consequence, the children are detected very later and by the time they seek any help or if the help is available, 
and the professionals are unable to make a great deal of difference um, in, uh, in the outcomes of their uh, speech and communication. It's not moving. Okay. Uh, so universal hearing, newborn hearing screening in the developed countries was started only in around, in the UK, it started only in 2001. Uh, even 20 years later, there is no universal screening in many, many of these uh, developing lower and middle income countries. There are maybe those who have is only numbered in one or two, such as maybe Oman is one of them, probably in Singapore, just only few countries have got them, but majority of them do not have any newborn hearing screening. So we do not know the incidence of actual deafness among those countries. Uh, until recently, as I said, until 20 years ago, only distraction tests were used in the developing countries such as United Kingdom, where they're, you, you know, they're mainly tested into seven or eight months of age. Now this technology has developed the, uh, with the emergence of autoacoustic emissions and screening ABR, which are routinely used in the, all for newborn children in the, uh, in the developing countries. Uh, because most of them are born in the uh, uh, hospitals or in the institutions, they're all tested even before they are discharged from the hospital. And in, imagine, I think it's such a big challenge for in lower and middle income countries because um, the majority of the children are home births or you know, they're not institutional births. In India, until recently, there were nearly 60% of the children were born uh, at home, home births. So even still is the case in, uh, in many developing countries. Uh, these uh, screening tests is a very simple test, takes only two minutes, and it'll tell you whether it's a pass or fail. If the pass means there's, you know, probably there is hearing available, uh, the cochlea is functioning normally. And if it's fail, possibly they may not be very well. So they need further tests such as diagnostic tests, diagnostic ABR, um, to uh, confirm whether the child is deaf, and if so, uh, the degree of deafness. There are, sometimes there are false positives and false negatives by these screening tests. Um, the, once the child has failed the screening test, and we need to be, they need to be tested in a, uh, in a, at a center where there are facilities available, the, the testing is uh, to establish the thresholds is a little more difficult because uh, majority of them done by the diagnostic auditory brainstem response, but they also need to be combined with uh, 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 the behavioral tests such as visual reinforcement audiometry or toy tests or you know, um, uh, you know pro providing various sounds to these children and establishing the real thresholds. There is a new equipment, the new piece of equipment available is called auditory steady state response. The diagnostic ABR is mainly test the high frequencies where ASSR can test the whole frequencies in both ears at the same time. The above tests need to be performed in a soundproof room and the children have to be sedated or they need to be asleep. And they need well qualified and trained audiologists to uh, undertake these tests. Once you establish the diagnosis and the degree of deafness, they need uh, the sound stimulation by hearing aids. Just providing hearing aids is not just like, unlike the spectacles which uh, provide good vision for, uh, for visual, visual loss. These hearing aids, just provision of the hearing aids is not good enough and they'll have multiple problems. The hearing molds need to be done and the knee molds need to be changed as the child is growing and the bat battery needs to be replaced from, from uh, intermittently every few weeks or months. And uh, once you fit the hearing aids, they need to be tested in the free field to see whether the sound reception, sound perception is uh, there or not. If it is there, then that's good. Then the amplification is providing. Once the child can hear some sounds, they want to provide some sounds in return. So those sounds are articulated into a word 
uh, which you know normally we do not even realize that uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the the speech therapy is essential to convert those words uh, to these sounds into words, and then there is another uh, language therapy which these words are converted into a language so that the child can start communicating in a you know in sentences and uh, and proper language. And few of those children who got very profound hearing loss, despite the, however, uh, with the, the sound stimulation by the hearing aids may not be adequate and need some cochlear implants. And uh, uh, these, these, ideally, all these tests are done under one roof, where all the services are done under one roof, where there is interaction between the screeners, and the, uh, the audiologists and speech therapists and language therapists, if the child is not progressing very well, the audiologist can test the, uh, the hearing aids and see if there is an adequate amplification, are they working or not. Uh, and then the, the progress can be ascertained by all the professionals together. Um, so it's very important, not only just to teach the, the child, but also the parents, because the, the child cannot stay at school all the time, and the parents need to reinforce the training at home. Um, unless it's all collectively work together, we do not get good outcomes at all. And as I said, this commitment is essential on the part of the parents, and the, you need to have a dedicated team of these people, of the screeners and speech therapists and language therapists and everyone. And this uh, the training is not just for a few weeks or a few months. I think it takes quite nearly two years, at least, a vigorous teaching of two years, really to provide to get good outcomes of the speech and hearing. The main goal is by the time the child is five years of age, the, they can gain the speech and hearing, and they can be integrated into the mainstream schools. And once they go into the mainstream schools, I think they still will not be as good as a normal hearing ch children, but they still, the background noise will be uh, uh, causing them a lot of problems. And sometimes the educational audiologists, sometimes people might be able to help them at school as well. So we are this, um, I have started this service in a place called Hyderabad in India. That was nearly 15 years ago. Um, so it, there were a lot of uh, impediments, barriers uh, to really provide this service. So eventually we uh, took hold of it. So far, we have screened about you know, 135,000 children. And we screen children in the, all the maternity hospitals in this. And also we have a, uh, one of the Rotarians have given us a van with a soundproof room at the back where we go to the villages and do some rural screening. So uh, there are the, once you go to the rural areas, there are uh, all kinds of, all age children will come there and you cannot say, well, we can't test them. So we need to test every child. Even those who come to the outpatients or in the, uh, in the uh, pediatric outpatients, in a peripheral, uh, in a tertiary hospitals. So they just want to get tested. So we need to test a lot of children. So there is a variety of age groups where we did test. So it's still nearly 135,000 children we have tested. So it says only 1,316 children have failed it. Uh, this, this data is maybe a year old, but still because of the pandemic, we have not updated the figures actually. So now what happens to 1300 children who fail the screening test? So we invited all of them, the 1300 children to, for the, uh, to uh, come to the center. Uh, to the outset, I think I need to declare that all the services are absolutely free. Not even a penny is charged for the patient. So uh, among the 1,316 children whom we said, well, they framed the screen test, your child may be deaf, please come to the center, we do everything for you. See, the children who came are only 765 children. So 
551 did not even turn up. And the, we, we get a lot of children, not only from the screening program, what we have, and also word of mouth. Some people will be, uh, would have had tests somewhere else, or maybe the parents would have uh, suspicion about the child's deafness. They are directly referred, the pediatricians are referred directly to the center. So we got a total children of 1,830. Out of them, 765 are referred from the screening program. So, and the thousand, more than 1,065 children are from the other areas, uh, non-screening program. So out of 1,316 who came to the, uh, from the screening program, 765 visited the center and 551 did not. Among those who visited the center, and they are 323 are diagnosed deaf and 44, 442, they, because you know, sometimes the child doesn't sleep and the child will be moving, we are unable to test them. We said, well, you know, we cannot do the uh, test the child today. Despite giving sedation, sometimes it's not very successful. Tell them, well, you know, I'll give you another appointment for a week later, would you come back? They don't turn up. So you can just see 442 children and just completely disappeared after that. Only they came first, but we could not succeed and they never came back again. Uh, we try to contact them. The girls will try to contact them regularly, but they kept enter until they had fitted with the hearing aids. And despite confirming the deafness, 91 children did not even come back again. And uh, so out of 303, uh, 232 are fitted with hearing aid, rest of them did not come. So this is only just say where they came from. And this Nilofar hospital is the main tertiary hospital where you know these, uh, most the entire state will be referred to that particular hospital. So that's where we get most of our children. And that's very close to the, uh, our, uh, our center. And the screeners will, we know, knowing these parents, the screener will bring the patients along with the, uh, the children and the parents to the center herself. And then, you know, we'll do the testing on the same day if possible. Um, but as I said, sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. And this is, we go to all the rural areas and this is being tested in our van uh, in the rural area where we did a uh, the screening test. Um, and this is where we, we do some camps in some places where the children are tested for screening or uh, uh, screened. And there we go, we go to a village. You can see this is the van with the soundproof room at the back. And we, well, you know, the cooperation from the officials is very, very important. Before we go to the village, the uh, people, uh, uh, the health officials, uh, the officials will inform the village head or the, you know, uh, there are something called uh, Anganwadi workers who uh, looks after these uh, uh, pregnant mothers and all. They will inform all these mothers, come over and they will get your child tested. So that's how the parents will there, come there. And once village is done, we go to the next village. So this is just a, a small video of uh, screening. That's our van. Just go right way ground and it just leaves the city and comes to the village. And parents start arriving. Registering them.
That's the OAE test. So once the those children who fail the screen tests are invited to a center in the city, in Hyderabad, and where the the, the brainstem work response is uh, uh, carried out to establish the thresholds of the child, uh, uh, their deafness, and then we fit the hearing aids. And look, the happy faces once we fit the hearing aid, they can hear some sounds. And these are all the children who come to the center for speech and language therapy. So you see the age groups, with different age groups, they all come around. So this, this is a mother. Well, I just wanted to share this story with you. The mother is deaf. And she, the mother was uh, 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 one of the children. Uh, the, uh, ten, she's one of the 10 children. Her three Three, two of uh, her sisters also are deaf. So she's aware of the center uh, because her, she brought her younger sister who's also deaf. Uh, she came to a center. So now she's, well, she could not get another partner. She's, she married another deaf boy. And they have three girls and all three girls are deaf. And now this, the, she needed to, overcome a lot of barriers to bring these children because the you know in-laws and parents would not agree for her to seek any help or they do not want them to uh, go to the center and regularly get the treatment oh well you know god has given us like this let's see It'll, you know they, they will improve themselves so the mother persisted and she brings and you know children are getting some improvement so these are, we give some AVTs and speech therapy and language therapy. And this is, uh, I'll just share you another little video. Sariko Kuchali, ma, ma, go, ma, ma, go. Ba, Dana, Nana. What do we call? Okay. Ba, 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 Hunt. Banana, Edi. Idi Kadu. Banana. Ibu. Edda Kacha Patlid. Abu. Idi. Pedda Chapu. Atto. Atto. Tata. Tata. Nana. Banana, ba, 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 Ma, ma, ma. Set. Okay, that one. Okay, you can set Ma, ma. Okay, very good. ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。ラ。
This is the team of uh, the uh, professionals who are looking after that. There are three of them are uh, screeners and you got the speech and language therapist. These young ladies are audiologists and she's the manager of the trust. M majority of them are being led by women, but the rural screening, I think we only use some boys because they need to travel from place to place and it's very difficult for a woman to travel from the city to the villages. Um, so, well, you know, so far we have nearly, this is a last year figure, there is nearly 142 children who had no speech or hearing, have completely uh, gained both and have been integrated into normal schools. Well, was it easy? No, there are a lot of challenges for especially for a, 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 a charitable service and funding is essential. I think, you know, it is costing me 25 to 30,000 pounds a year just to run this service. And you need to get, uh, well, we are lucky in Hyderabad because there are uh, universities offering the courses for the audiology, BSc and MSc in audiology. So we can get the audiologists uh, reasonably. Um, which is not the case in most of the developing countries or most of the low and middle income countries. There are no audiologists available at all. And main thing is the bureaucracy. And it is very, very difficult to um, get any cooperation from them at all. If they have cooperation from them, the, if they can facilitate this service, it's great. You can run very, very smoothly. And there was one or two occasions, they, some officials have cooperated with us and where we, the child who failed the screen test, they used to bring the child to the center and get them tested. And it is very difficult for the parents to come and stay here because there are a lot of barriers for the patients to come in. There are cultural barriers, there are financial barriers. The, the, the barriers for the, uh, for the parents are, uh, if they leave the village and come to the village, their livelihood will be lost and they cannot afford to stay in the city city is more expensive. And uh, the uh, financial aid is very difficult. And they have other children to look after. If the mother and child stays here, who's going to look after the other children and the husband? And, and the in-laws won't let them permit. The mother-in-law is the strongest one, wouldn't allow you to. There is, you know, one of the girls have come in there to the center and 
did the research and uh, did a present, uh, uh, published a paper. Um, so there are so many barriers and financially, culturally, culturally, they do not think, well, you know, God has given us like this. Well, let's see what the God does. And uh, it's very difficult for the mothers to show that commitment because they do not, they want to, the, the mother wants to, but she cannot because they, you know, they have seen, the mother has so many other things to look after. And as a consequence, the truancy, unless the child maintains that continuity, the progress will not be seen. And however much we struggle, the truancy is still there. They will simply disappear. There are festivals there, they have some functions there at home or whatever it is, they just disappear for a month and the progress with the child was showing well, goes back again. So there is lack of commitment from the parents. That's, that's the main issue. Um, in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, children with hearing impairment needed, need very dedicated team to detect, diagnose, intervene, and habilitate. Um, and mainly the support from the local government is very important, it's essential. If you do, then it's very successful. And it, my, I had to stop my rural screening because it was costing me so much but I'm unable to say, even if I spend 15,000 pounds a year on only a rural screening, and I get two children to really help. And it's not really cost effective. Um, and the, the, the commitment from the service providers, and you know, like who is providing, because to sustain that kind of um, input where the returns are not that many, is very, very difficult to cope. And, the, uh, and for the commitment from the parents also is essential to have good outcomes for speech and hearing and also communication. Possibly if the care is offered very close to home, I think you know some grandmother or someone will bring the child and the mother and, can, uh, uh, mother and father can continue with their work and then you know, provide some reasonable income for the families. Um, and also it's easier for them. It's much cheaper to come to live in a, in a rural area than coming to the city where it's a lot more expensive. So these are all the challenges, but, but it's very, very gratifying to see um, that Moyin, you have seen that nine-year-old boy, his father uh, had six children, five of them were girls. And after five girls, this was the boy who was born and he was devastated when you know, the boy was born deaf. And he used to cycle 23 kilometers each day, every day, 46 kilometers, to get some kind of help for this child. So he went for two years with no improvement whatsoever. This boy came at the age of maybe five or six to our center because he saw the father has seen someone else wearing the hearing aids given by our center. So they brought them to our center. And now he's a star. So, you know, he, now he has even finished his schooling, bright colors. So he was going for, it's a BTEC, the engineering and uh, uh, vocational engineering in a, uh, in a university. So I'm very, very pleased with that progress. I think there are quite a few children who are nearing the university now for the time being because they came very young to us. Um, and the ignorance of the parents is enormous. When the child is making very, very good progress, they suddenly think, well, my child, I want my child to be educated in English medium school. So they go back to a different language when they're just learning the language and they, you know, their progress will be deterred again. So these are all the challenges which we overcome, but it is very gratifying to those children who completely gain both speech and hearing and communication and integrated with normal children. Wonderful, thank you very much, Vijay. Um, hopefully you can still hear me. Um, yes, thank you for thank that you. wonderful talk. Um, I, I would like to just open it out now to the um, participants, um, if there are any questions. 
Uh, perhaps I'll kick off with a question of, of my own. Um, I know that there may be some people listening who don't have a newborn hearing screening program in their country. Uh, I'd like to hear from you on, on who in your experience can uh, be trained to use the OAE devices? Is this, you know, you mentioned some audiologists that you, that you have. Um, is this something that a non-audiologically trained health professional or, or a non-health professional, like a village healthcare worker, could be trained to use um, and maintain? Uh, for the screening, I don't think you need any qualifications. There's some school education is enough for them to enter the data and other things. They want, anybody can be trained. Uh, very easily. But the problem is, you know, as we discuss in our meetings regularly, uh, screening a child, children for deafness and say, well, you know, your child could be deaf, but unless it is followed with other facilities where they can be diagnosed, where, you know, further evaluation can be done, that's not of any great benefit. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I think if you have one of the facilities, uh, all the facilities are available. They screen the children, anybody can screen them. Whereas the testing, for the testing, I think it's nice to have some audiologists, such as you know, doing a brainstem or response audiometry or um, fitting the hearing aids and programming the hearing aids. Well, I think they need uh, more training. Excellent, thank you. Um, can I open it out to anyone uh, in the audience who would like to uh, any questions? Yeah, BK, you know, I'd just like to make a comment. I, I can really associate with your comments in your lecture. One of the things I've noticed in a fair amount of countries, and I've worked in 25 countries, some of them just don't even have audiologists. We talk about, for example, Peru. It's a country of 40 million. There were like the last time I checked, there were like less than 10 audiologists for 40 million. And obviously most of them are working in private clinics because that's where they can obtain salaries that are more comparable to their needs. You go to a country like Ethiopia and we have one of our participants today, Essie, he's on, he's on this conference. Ethiopia's got 110 million people. The last time I heard they had two audiologists for 110 million. And then on the other spectrum, you go to like Brazil. Brazil has more audiologists than any other country per capita. I think they have like 20,000 for a population of, gosh, I'm not sure Brazil's 100 or 200 million. So, you know, it's just, it's just, there's such a, a, a variation in qualified people in the professional level. And again, as you say, you can train people on the basic level to do screening. But, you know, the, the, the thing is, what do we do when we need the, the other support from the professional community when it's not there? It's always the challenge. Yeah, well, you, you, you talk about Peru and Brazil has got so many. I'm, I'm sure that, you know, some of the Peruvian girls or boys can go down to Brazil or any other country. But the government, if they are aware of what it takes really for it, uh, you know, the consequences of deafness, they probably will do that. But in most of the developing countries, there are too many competing causes, issues where, you know, funding is necessary. But I think this, because the blindness will cause a lot more emotion among people. Whereas deafness doesn't because the person looks absolutely fit because it's very silent. So, you know, once the, the uh, officials do understand the importance of deafness and how urgently it needs to be addressed and they probably may be able to fund them. And if, in any, 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 any person who is undertaking some charitable work, sustaining it for a long term is not possible. So we can start it. And if the government can take over and provide the salaries for these people, then you know, other people can support. 
that's what we discuss, uh, Misha and I, we discuss in our global health meetings on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Yep. I there's would like a that a lot we know, but there's a lot more to know. Uh, we have a Gata here from Poland. Yes. I would like to uh, just uh, mention something about Poland. In Poland, we also we have a national uh, program of deafness in children, and it starts just uh, an amazing way because one guy every year, uh, it starts uh, 30 years ago, he started a national collection money just in January to, uh, and he was um, organizing some uh, concerts. And then uh, people got, uh, in uh, collection the money and he found that in Poland we don't have this uh, national program of screening. He for this for his for the money of of, of all of over uh, people from uh, Poland, he bought uh, the uh, uh, equipment which is need for uh, auto emission and uh, give them to the all hospitals. And because we have a national health system, then he give a, a present uh, in, in, in this equipment. And that's why in Poland, we have now possibility to check all the children. Yeah. One of the biggest expenses is the hearing aids as well. Yes, And it yes. is very then, difficult, they're, they're still expensive, the hearing aids, especially those children who have got severe profound hearing loss. I think they, they need very strong, powerful hearing aids, which are still very expensive. Yes, Technology is I developing. Think, uh, but I think that the really the first thing is uh, just to make the screening. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Technology is developing. The screening machine used to cost nearly ten thousand pounds or seven thousand pounds to start with when mm -hmm. I started, and you know the probe used to be repaired goes used to go for a repair each time. I used to spend a thousand pounds for that one. Now the machine is two and a half thousand pounds. You can mm -hmm. get an OAE machine. It's much cheaper now. So a lot of a lot more companies are producing the OAE machine. The technology is, uh, is making great strides. Anybody else have any comments? Yeah, uh, Prof. Uh, I'm Azi from Somaliland. Uh, our condition is different for what uh, our Dr. PJ is. It's a, it's a great lecture. Thank you, Dr. PJ and Misha and Professor Richard uh, for having such a good lecture. But our condition in Somaliland is very, very severe. We don't have a single audiologist, it's good service, and we have only so three ENT specialists. So that condition, how the things would be, and there's no national program for deafness. So if I try to start something, for example, uh, how can how can how can I approach the things? Because of I we do have nurses. Can we train nurses for screening? And how 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 can these things be possible? Um, uh, Abdullah is well. You know, you have Misha's email address, don't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Just email your details to Misha and Misha and I will get in touch with you. We can collaborate and I'll guide you to, you know, to start something like that in Somaliland. Thank you so much, dear Prof, and I really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you so much. Any more comments or questions? I don't believe I have any more. Misha, do yeah. you have any more comments? George no. is trying to con connect, I think, to the audio. Okay. I don't know what happened to Misha. Um, uh, no, I'm still here. So um, okay. um, I, th I think if there are no more comments, it's just uh, left for me to thank you very much, Vijay, for your fantastic talk. Um, very inspiring um, videos as well. 
um, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, and um, uh, you know, happy new year. Um, and I wish you all the very best. So thank you, Vijay. Vijay, thank you very much for sharing your your thanks work. Thanks, Richard and Misha. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Okay.